When I was about five years old, I was out playing in the woods beside my house and found a bunch of old records laying in the dirt. They were real thick records, and most of the labels were written in German. And no one in my family knew what they were, but I eventually found out that they were Edison Diamond Disc. Ever since then, I've always wanted an old Edison Diamond Disc phonograph. When I saw one on Craigslist this week for only 150 bucks, I jumped on it, figuring I'd never see another one that cheap again. The guy I bought it from also gave me one Diamond Disc record to go with it. Now, as I listened to the voice coming through the speaker, I began to feel that God put this record in front of me for a reason. The recording was made by someone I had never heard of. His name was Jose Mojica. I began to research him, and I'm very glad I did. Jose was born in Mexico in 1896. As a young teenager, he was already tall and strong. He ran with a tough crowd and eventually joined Francisco Madera's group of revolutionaries that ousted Diaz from power during the Mexican Revolution. It was also about this time that Jose discovered he had a real talent for singing opera. Overnight, he was able to bring his family out of poverty and become a sensation both in Mexico and abroad. But this was just the beginning. While on a trip to Mexico, Enrico Caruso, of all people, took in an opera in which Jose was appearing. He was so taken with the young singer that he had him brought over to his table. They quickly became friends for what was left of Caruso's short life and Caruso, unbeknownst to Mojica, recommended him to the producer of the Ravenia Festival in Chicago in 1919. Jose would remain there for the next nine years singing with the Chicago Opera. It was during this time that Thomas Edison signed him to sing for Edison Records after having no luck finding any good Italian tenors. Before long, Mojica's talents and good looks also came to the attention of movie producers, and in 1930 he made his only American movie called One Last Kiss in which he played a sort of Zorro-like singing cowboy. He made several other films in America aimed primarily at a Mexican audience, and afterwards he would go back to Mexico and become a regular big screen attraction there, where he was known as the Mexican version of Valentino. Qué hermosa es todo esto, ¿no? Más hermosa eres tú. Por cierto, aún no me has dicho tu nombre. Creí que los cíngaros que decís la buena aventura lo sabíais todo. ¿De qué? ¿Le parece? José Montero cantando para mí solita. Y qué hermosa canción. ¿Quién le habrá inspirado? But he also, for some unexplainable reason, would very often find himself playing religious roles in both films and operas, 
even though he was not a particularly religious person like his mother. In fact, Jose was always in search of a good time, and more often than not he found it. He always had an eye for the ladies, and the lady sure had an eye for him. He had several friends in both the opera and movie industries. People like John Wayne and John Ford and Gary Cooper would often visit his sprawling Mexican estate. He would later give this estate to his mother as a gift. He never knew his father, and like a lot of young boys in that situation, he grew up being very close to his mother. After her death in 1942, his life would take a staggering turn. Before she died, she asked him to give his life to the church. This was the one woman in his life that he found hard to refuse. But another would soon enter. He was working in America at the time, all the while deep in grief and depression, when he suddenly had a vision of St. Teresa of Avila, who outright commanded him to follow the path of Christ. Now he was certain of what he had to do. At the age of 46, he gave away all his possessions, most of it to the church, and started a new career. He boarded a plane for Peru with nothing but $35 in his pocket and joined the Franciscan order as a monk. He was given the name of Fray Jose de Guadalupe Mojica. Within five years, he would attain priesthood. After becoming a full-fledged priest, the church decided they would use his talents rather than put them to waste, and he could often be found singing at many fundraiser events while also doing missionary work. He eventually worked in three more films over the next 20 years, always playing himself as a priest, with the proceeds going to the church. He wrote two of these films, including one which was based on his big-selling 1958 autobiography, I, a Sinner, which he wrote to earn funds for the rebuilding of a school which had fallen from an earthquake. During the mid-1950s, he counseled another great Mexican movie star, Humberto Amazon, advising him also to follow the Gospels, turn his back on the bright lights, and give away all his possessions, which he did. And today, Father Amazon's story is equally inspiring. In 1969, Jose was given a tribute by the National Institute of Fine Arts in Mexico City. He was beginning to go deaf, and it was one of the last events at which anyone would ever hear him sing. Soon after, he returned to Peru, where he spent his final years in retirement among friends and fellow monks. He died in 1974 of heart problems, and oddly, like Thomas Edison, who had given him his start in recording, he was nearly completely deaf, but as content as a man can be in this world. It's been said that Edison liked Mohica's voice so much that he played his records every night before going to bed. Even though he was so deaf, he had to actually bite down on the phonograph console so the vibrations of the record would travel through his teeth and make their way to his inner ear. For 150 bucks, I feel like I got a lot more than just a record machine. I got an education.